Uh, thank you for coming out to our next to the last, our penultimate talk of, the, of this year's lecture series. Um, really appreciate your coming on a nice warm uh, Sunday. It's uh, my privilege to introduce Ted Hall. He's going to talk about the attractive cattle uh, <laughs> that, uh, that grace the fence down here uh, and uh, wander about. And uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Ted to. Uh, Delight to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. I hope you won't be hesitant to uh, raise your hand or interrupt me during the course of our uh, discussion so that uh, this can be more of a conversation than just a presentation. Sometimes when we're using a PowerPoint and so on, it creates this sense of, of uh, distance between the speaker and the audience. And please help me uh, get across that. I'm happy to be here today with my wife, Laddie. Back here. The central member of our family business, and we call ourselves Book Founders. Uh, so I make sure I pay attention to that. Uh, I'm going to uh, basically talk in three uh, bits today. I'm going to give you a brief history of who we are. Uh, that may not seem directly relevant to the cattle and the mollusks, but I think it, it will set some important context for you about who we are and why we do what we do. Uh, I'm, I'll uh, have a lot of fun helping you understand why these funny Highland cattle are here and the key attributes of, of that kind of cattle. And then we'll talk briefly about uh, why and tamales, after all. So, uh, a bit of family history, uh, my mother and grandfather were among the earliest uh, organic gardeners in the late 40s in western Pennsylvania. That whole idea was invented by a guy named Rodale. Any of you ever subscribed to the organic gardening magazine? It says Rodale Publishing. So uh, they uh, inspired me. We lived on a small hobby farm. It really inspired me to take seriously uh, what that all meant. Uh, I had the good fortune of having a father that is, was a chemical engineer, uh, was part of a secret project to invent artificial rubber during World War II. Uh, to get kind of the tone of this right, uh, he had a security clearance and he would tease my mother endlessly while I sat at the kitchen table that she was going to cause him to lose his security clearance because all organic farmers were communists. <laughs> Still are. Still are, right? Still are. Thank you, Al Gore. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it framed our, our perspective. Uh, and as I am happy to weave through the story as we go forward, is that we view organic as not a belief system has nothing to do with red states and blue states throughout. Besides my joke, it has nothing to do with Al Gore. We actually believe and, and demonstrate in what we do that it results in higher quality at lower cost. Namely, it raises everybody's standard of living and there's nothing that we do that isn't based on scientific first principle. So we're not even evangelical. I'm not here like the Hare Krishna who's trying to convert you. Uh, we do it because it makes business sense. And, and the reason that we are so proud of that is because that's the only way that you can take this stuff seriously. If it doesn't make business sense, why are you doing it? Right. So, uh, as it happens, what we do here in Tobolus is part of that larger, uh, that larger picture. I had the good fortune to start making wine 52 years ago. I was a graduate student at Stanford and happened to meet a, um, an uh, early pioneer at Ridge Vineyards in the Santa Clara Mountains. Uh, some of you may know that the very famous uh, Montebello Cabernet is, uh, comes from that area. They were a relatively new winery at the time. Uh, and because I uh, got into this conversation about having this uh, farming background and I was very interested in uh, organic practices, he said to me, Ted, why don't you make wine? And I said, I can't make wine. He said, I'll help you. And so here we are 52 years later, uh, primarily uh, focused on the, on the wine business. So in the late 80s, uh, I 
the first 17 vintages were basically large scale amateur. They really weren't commercial uh, quantity, and there was a lot of wine. Uh, but in the late 80s, we decided that we wanted to pursue this more uh, seriously, and we went to the, the Napa Valley, where we found some uh, great uh, locations. And uh, the vision from the beginning was to make an elegant, balanced wine that was genuinely a complement to food using entirely sustainable and organic farming methods. Uh, in 1989, uh, people thought I was crazy. Right? It was without precedent. And in fact, uh, we were, among three other wine wineries, we were the first organically certified uh, vineyards in Napa County. So we were really out there on the on the bleeding the bleed edge. <clears throat> but uh, to farm organically, especially uh, in, the, in the center of the country, it's virtually impossible to do that well if you are a monocrop, a monoculture. Uh, because the, 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 the farming effectively really requires multiple crops uh, working together, taking advantage of the byproduct of one to the other, to enhance its total, the total performance of the system. So what we discovered <clears throat> on a property that we acquired uh, that had first been claimed by a Civil War veteran named E.J. Church in 1872. And he planted grapes. This is very early for anywhere in California. The longest standing winery in Napa Valley was 19, 1866. So this is at, right after the Civil War. You could make a claim of excess government property by filing what's called a patent grant, and you could get 640 acres. Uh, all you had to do was to agree to take care of it. And so that's what this guy, E.J. Church, did. He planted grapes in the 1870s, and uh, he and his family farmed there until the early 20s when Prohibition came along and it lost its economic viability. So the property was overgrown with uh, uh, second growth forest, and when we bought the property, knowing that there were these historic uh, uh, vineyard sites, uh, what we didn't know, hidden in the, in the trees, were olives. And in fact, they were, plant, we have, they were planted by E.J. Church in the right soil. Some of you may know that, that uh, uh, grapes hate boron, uh, but olives love boron. And so the places where there was boron in the soil, they planted olives. And when they were, they, how did they know? I don't know. <laughs> and where they were uh, proper soils, they planted grapes. But this was the beginning of what we now call full circle farming. Because the farm effectively, and, and to create an interrelated system, we were able to take grapes and olives and combine them in the first step of our farming system. The, uh, most people don't realize that uh, olives and grapes have been grown for millennia around the Mediterranean. And that was very typical of, a, of an Italian family farm. They never had ever been grown together, maybe except for E.J. Church. Uh, here in California, they've always been viewed as a specialty crop. But the, the, the key to that uh, full circle farming was that it turns out that these, these crops are perfectly uh, complementary. So uh, we harvest uh, grapes in August, September, and October. We haul, harvest olives in November, December, and January. We harvest, we prune January, February, and March grapes. We prune olives in March, July, uh, April, May. We sucker grapevines in June and July, we sucker olives in July and early August, and it creates a full cycle of employment throughout the year. And even better, it's very capital efficient because we get two crops from the same set of tractors. We get two truck crops from the same set of bins. We get two crops from the same uh, trailers. But it's even more interesting. So when you, when you make olive oil and it gets pressed, you get three things. You get uh, Oil, hopefully, right? But you get a very large amount of water, vegetable water, is what it's called, and you get sansa, which is the solid. Some of you know in winemaking, the solids in winemaking are pumice, right? 
So I'll go get to the cattle, I promise you. Um, <laughs> but this is all terribly relevant. This is what I, what I, I hope you'll understand. Is that, <clears throat> so um, that vegetable water is extremely high in nitrogen. Uh, it's the highest concentration of naturally occurring nitrogen in any agricultural crop. If you're a farmer, you know what you need, man. You need nitrogen. So here, here it is. And so we took the waste stream from making olive oil. We built a facility that was both winery and olive oil. So it was the first combined winery in the history of the United States. Uh, and uh, built that so that we could take advantage of this high nitrogen byproduct. So we took all of our winery waste, all of our small caliper prunings, and took that pumice, uh, I mean Sansa, and the vegetable water, and what do you do? You create a very large scale composting system. And that very large scale composting system helps to create this full circle of farming that results in higher quality, lower costs. Why? Everybody else in the Napa Valley pays to have their winery waste removed. They burn their uh, small caliper prunings. Uh, then they pay for fertilizer to bring it back. We skip both steps because 500 tons of compost goes back to the vineyards, back to the orchards, and restarts the cycle. Right? You start to see this. Right? So where did the nitrogen come from that were in the olive trees? Almost the cow. <laughs> Where did the nitrogen come from the cattle, from, from in the olive trees? It had to have come from the ground, right? And how does all nitrogen get into the ground? It comes from lagoons. There's rhizomes that take the their, their, their complementary guys on the on the roots of the of the lagoons that help extract nitrogen and put it into the soil. Right? So now, so we have to grow, we have to grow uh, uh, clover cover crops across all of our orchards. So to make sure that we have seeds so that when we finally mow it, that it will regenerate itself over the years, what do we need? We have to pollinate it. How do we pollinate it? We do it with bees. So suddenly my farming system now is producing wine, olive oil, and honey, right? And we actually produce honey on a commercial basis. So now we have this big, wonderful, crop of, of clover. So I don't want to have the expense of figuring out how to mow all that. So what do we put on the cover crop? <laughs> Yearly calves <laughs> and sheep. Right? The clove hoof. They won't eat the trees uh, uh, above their head height. They, the clove hooves help uh, aerate the soil. The seeds from the, the, uh, the clover get uh, an extra boost with the poop. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly now, I'm producing in this farming system, right, wine, olive oil, honey, and beef. And I've, on multiple courses of the, of the process, helped lower the cost. Now you start to get that this stuff is for real, right? So what happened, uh, on our, you know, our home ranch is that uh, we've developed this full uh, circle farming uh, idea really to, uh, uh, some people would say, extreme. So uh, we produce wine, olive oil, uh, bees and honey, which I've already discussed. We also raise organic fruits and vegetables. But the really cool thing about organic fruits and vegetables is the way that old timers did it is you always had a, a fruit and vegetable uh, business, but you also had poultry simultaneously with it. If you're a truck farmer producing stuff for the farmer's market or sending it to grocery store, you lose about 30% of your crop to uh, spoilage, uh, or it goes unsold, or it's blemished. Right? So that's a lot to lose from your crop. Well, if you're doing it side by side with, with poultry, guess what? It feed the chickens with all the unused vegetables. We used to sell eggs to a really fancy restaurant called Aubert's Soleil in Napa County. And uh, well, actually, we sold we sold them. We tried to sell them tomatoes. And sometimes you would buy the tomatoes, sometimes you wouldn't. 
And our response to him, he said, well, if you don't buy these tomatoes, you're going to buy them later. <laughs> Why is that? Because he really loved the egg. <laughs> you know, and he put it on fancy dishes, right? But the eggs were almost neon in their color. Why? Because it's the red, green, blue, black vegetables that they were getting. So now I'm producing ultra-high quality eggs at uh, higher cost, higher, higher sales revenue, right? At lower cost, because I don't have to feed them very much to supplement their feed from the, the farming. And I now have, don't lose 30% of my crop professionals. Right? You get it? Right? So what we're doing here, right, is basically just an extension of that. Right? And, and it's part of the a part of the of the bigger vision. The most important thing though was that when I started out, I was considered a total idiot. <laughs> They, they couldn't believe that you could grow or stuff organically in the mountains and down the valley. It, it, you couldn't possibly be building a farming system that resulted in higher quality and lower cost because everybody knows that it costs more to farm organically. And, you know, it's only taken 30 years for me to go from idiot to celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Uh, a lot of folks weren't too sure about what we were doing here when we first came to Jamalis. So, uh, a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so, how did we get into the beak? Well, it was an extension of what I've already described to you. We acquired some adjacent parcels uh, that were uh, luckily made available to us by some friendly neighbors, and uh, we were, uh, the, the parcels really weren't in very good condition. There was plenty of invasive grasses, uh, there were you know, problems with erosion. Uh, and uh, lots and lots of, of weeds, as I've already said. There were high mountain grasslands and very difficult for, for uh, most conventional farmers to figure out how they would take advantage of them. So we were looking for a way to responsibly maintain those lands uh, to extend the scope of this full circle farming concept that I've described to you, to make the property commercially viable Remember, we're always trying to do this actually to make money. You know, if you do, if you, you can do good and you can make money. And in fact, it's easier to do good if it makes money. Right? Right? So it's not a tax, right? It's not a burden. It actually allows you to make money. And we also, as you now all, we all know, but especially we know now since 2017, is that we need to denigrate fire risk. And that was a very important part of it. So, Again, just having the cattle lowers my, interest, my insurance rates, right? Mm. This stuff isn't crazy, right? You just have to be able to think about it in terms of the, of the whole system. So we got started in, in uh, 1997. I had a friend visiting us who owned a small cattle station in Australia uh, where they had uh, begun to raise Highland cattle. We received a, a really strong recommendation that we consider that. So in 98, uh, we acquired seven Highland cattle. Uh, and in, uh, uh, we took our very first trip to the National Western Stock Show in uh, uh, early, actually in uh, 1999, uh, which is the largest livestock show in the country. It happens to be where the Highland breed has its annual show and also holds an annual auction. And so I bravely began to buy some animals and bring them back to find the very best possible genetic foundation. And uh, uh, we did that for uh, several years. Uh, the biggest uh, move forward for us was in 2002, we purchased 60 head of the very best Highland genetics. So a young woman uh, who's her family were showing at the National Western Stock Show. Uh, she chose to uh, sell her herd while she went to college. Uh, I'm very proud to say Laddie and I essentially put her through college. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was more uh, after that initially arrived, plus the cattle that we'd obviously bred, we realized that we were overextending the property that we had in the Napa Valley. Uh, so what did we do? We went to the Napa Valley of Grass. That's literally what they call it. It's Herndale. It's in Humboldt County. It has the richest uh, grasses. There's scientific studies that say that this is the richest grass 
in the in the country, and that's where all the milk was converted to butter, and then went down by steam earlier by sailboat, but steamship from Humboldt from Humboldt Bay to San Francisco, and so that was the early source of uh, of, of butter to that that location. Um, in 2005, we acquired the property here in Wallace, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and in 2006, we uh, brought our mother cow herd uh, here to the Tamales. So we've been here, uh, well, we've owned the property for 18 years. Uh, we've been here for 17 years, which means we're terribly newbies. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Unless I've been here 75, then you might start to consider it, right? So why hiring cows? Well, they're very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, I could delve into this in, in much greater detail than I will. But they are uh, among the oldest cattle breeds. They were first domesticated in the northern parts of the British Isles in the 6th century. Uh, and uh, they became uh, effectively registered. The very first herd book, this is the first herd book in the entire industry, it was done in 1885. And, and uh, I'm sure many of you guys are, are farmers, and you know we commonly use the word British breeds. And there's British breeds and the continental breeds of cattle. The British breeds evolved to be beef and milk because they had all of this, these native grasslands, large grasslands, and lots of water, lots and lots, lots and lots of rain. So the the whole high quality beef world is largely derivative from uh, the so-called British breeds. The, the uh, continental breeds, you'd never eat them, right? Because they were beasts of burden. They pulled oxen. They were oxes that pulled carts. And so they were all bred not to produce beef and milk. They were produced, they were bred to have big muscles and live a long time and not need to eat a lot of food. And so they're really, really different. Now, since about 1970, some part of the cattle industry just sort of screwed that up by introducing continental breeds with the, with the beef breeds. But the highest quality beef uh, across the board occurs from these British breeds. Well, what's interesting is that the Highlands are the antecedent. They are the first, they're the first genetics. And you can trace the genetics of Angus, Shorthorn uh, and Hereford all directly back to the, to the Highland cattle. Uh, and actually, they were brought here in 1855, uh, and they interbred with uh, some Spanish cattle that had been uh, brought here many years before. They came here first time in the 16th century. Uh, but that's what brought the, high, the Texas Longhorn. So if you look at this picture of the, of the animal behind me, and if you put it side by side with a, with a Texas Longhorn, you go, oh, I get this. So the, these, these are really, really uh, uh, foundational animals. The huge advantage of them is they've never been bred for a feedlot. Right? So, so that if you're breeding for a feedlot, you're worried about rapid rate of bread gain, and you want lots of intramuscular fat. And to have lots of intermuscular fat, you have to have lots of fat tissue, connective tissue. So, uh, which doesn't make them very good. Because they were so far back, and the beef was destined for the Duke's table, uh, the, the farmer who was delivering the beef to be served to the Duke was always terrified that it wouldn't be palatable, that they wouldn't like it. And so the stories go that, you know, if, if the Duke didn't like your beef, you went home and shot your bull. <laughs> or it's functionally equivalent, right? But you think about that, that's the natural process of selection, right? So this went on for several hundred years of people selecting their animals in this grass-based uh, fashion to be able to produce the highest quality beef. So in the UK, they refer to it as the beef of kings. Uh, it's highly palatable. Uh, the reason for that is that it has relatively large muscle fibers. 
Uh, if you look at it under a microscope, they're, they're larger and thin, thinner. They don't have a significant amount of connective tissue, uh, and they are remarkably flavorful. I got in an argument with a guy out of Cattle College that I mistakenly went to at Colorado State, um, and the guy stood up there and said, you know, the, only, the, the, the source of, of uh, uh, flavor in beef is the fat. And I said, well, I stood up and said, well, um, maybe it's one of the sources of flavor. I said, so how about something that's really lean, like venison? Does venison not have any flavor? <laughs> Right. And so this, what the, pro, the beef that's produced by the Highland breed is uh, foundational, adapted to grass, uh, has been multiple times selected for its effectiveness. It's never been influenced by attempting to finish it on grain or to put it through a confined uh, uh, feedlot uh, situation. And uh, not surprisingly, the um, the British royal family uh, continues to raise it. So this is Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, uh, taken about 15 years ago. Uh, there's this really fabulous livestock show called Royal Scotland, which I've never been able to go to, uh, that is the premier place for Highland cattle to be shown. And I've always wanted to go and see it and so on. But I tell you what's really amusing is I can't figure out why the Queen's cows always are the grand champion. <laughs> Can you imagine being the judge that says, I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but your cow didn't weigh, didn't measure up? So, uh, uh, if, I'm sure you guys travel and, and have had the chance to travel to, to Great Britain, but keep your eye out. You'll see. Uh, if you start looking closely, uh, the restaurants that specialize in beef, it's all Scottish, kind of. And, uh, and they really do often have it, a little thing on the menu that says the beef you can't. So the, the, the further advantage of uh, the cattle, because they've been basically bred this way, is they're extremely well suited for grass fed production. They have, they're moderately framed. Remember, an animal has to walk a mile or two a day to keep itself fed, right? So if it's big and overly muscular, it can't get around. It has to have good feet, uh, good shoulders, good hindquarters, and be of a size that it's actually an efficient system for grazing enough to be able to keep the animal healthy. So if you look out at our, our cattle, and your cattle, you'll see that they're, they are very balanced. They're not... Uh, uh, at, at the extreme. They have very strong legs and hips, which is important, as I just said, for grazing, but it's also very important for, for um, uh, breeding. It's one of the most important parts for, for you to look at for uh, a, uh, a bull. Um, the other really interesting thing about the animals is because they evolved such a long time in Scotland uh, and on open ground and you know when it gets cold they, they you need you need fuel is they're not very selective about grasses. One of the problems with lots of uh, cattle is they'll they'll eat all the good stuff and they'll leave all kinds of things behind. And the only way they'll even touch it is they get really hungry and already you've overgrazed the pasture and all you've really done is intensify the the, the wheat wheat growth. These guys will eat almost anything. Uh, and in fact, there are only four cattle breeds left in the world that are considered browsers. And the highlands are browsers, which means they'll eat woody, tree, woody seedlings and things like that. That's, so they're pretty close to their impact uh, in a constructive way uh, to goats. If carefully managed, you, you know, we, we produce lots of underbrush, lots of blackberries, uh, on our home ranch. If you start looking around here where we're, we're raising our cattle, there are a few places where the cattle won't go and that's where the blackberries are. <laughs> but they're not in the place else. And it's not because they like the berries, it's because they ate the plant. Uh, so that means that, that um, over time, you 
can graze effectively, feed the animals, and guess what? Not have ever-growing populations of weeds, right? Which is another way to cop to for energy farming. As those weed populations grow, guess what? It lowers your, it raises your cost, either because you have less grass, because now you have more weeds, or you have to come up with some system to be able to produce it. So these, these guys are really wonderfully um, adapted. They are exceptional mothers. Uh, they are easy calving. Um, Bill Jensen, who I mentioned a minute ago, I am sitting right here. I think in the 16 years we've been here, we've ever pulled a calf. Uh, and, you know, anybody in the cattle business, you can't, that's hard to believe, right? Uh, we've had a couple of problems, but they are uh, easy calving, and if we're using the right bull, uh, the size of the calf is, is completely adaptable. Uh, they're strong milk producers. Uh, they uh, have highly dependent, developed natural instincts. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. When we first had the Highland cattle and we were having calves at the high part of our, our ranch, I drove up there uh, one morning uh, just after daylight and one of our cows was calving and I really started to look at this and there was a ring of other cows all the way around her facing not towards her, facing out. Right? Like it was a, it was a, a defensive perimeter. You know why? Because there was a coyote circling. <laughs> what the coyote wanted to do is go get at least the afterbirth and maybe even be able to take down that cow. They don't do that. My next door neighbor, Dave Garden, who's raised Simmentals uh, for many, many years uh, and was breeding them there and we were breeding on, uh, we shared a, a long fence line. He'd lose calves to mountain lions. We never lost a calf to mountain lion. You know, they come equipped. And they are actually, they're actually prepared to to uh, use it. The other really interesting thing that I discovered the first time, and Laddie and I were out in the pasture just before we came, and, we, and you know, just to make sure I'm not crazy, this is actually still going on, is that I walked out, we call the back 40, and came over this little hill, and I saw this huge pile of, of, of fur uh, down in a, in a veil, and I thought, man, the, the mountain lion or somebody finally get all of our calves because it's just this pile of calves. There. And um, what I realized was the calves were all there and there was one cow uh, standing guard over them. And as we approached, uh, she knew that somebody was coming. She honked off with the craziest loud moo that you've ever heard. And it was like the, the Merrill Lynch commercial. Here came the thundering herd, right? To come take care of the babies. We just saw that this afternoon on this side, right back, right back here. We had one cow watching everybody, and there were six new calves right at her feet. So it's, it's remarkable. So again, guess what? Lower death loss, right? One more example of higher quality at lower cost. So, uh, and then the thing that's truly amazing is, uh, this is especially true for any of you ranchers here, is that with complete certainty, we'll get at least 10 calves out of our cows. We have cows that are calving, very healthy, totally sound udders that are 14 and 15 years old. So, guess what? Higher quality at lower cost, right? We need fewer replacements. We, we don't have to deal with with uh, unexpected uh, death loss. So it, it's, it's a uh, remarkable set of attributes. Uh, what makes it even more fun is that um, it's healthy. It's healthy beef. I already started to explain a minute ago about the intramuscular fat. So if you look at a prime steak, right, it's filled with all this fat. And it's being cared, carried by all this uh, connective tissue. If you don't have the fat, the beef isn't very fallible. If you do have the fat, it's very high in fatty content and cholesterol. Right? Because we have less intermuscular the fat, the, there's lots of science on this. I was the president of the Highland Cattle Foundation. Maybe I'm sorry to show that. Uh, which it, it does research on this breed uh, for the entire industry. And uh, these are 
uh, well-documented facts, there's less cholesterol in the equivalent portion size, six ounces, let's say, portion size, of skinless chicken breast and beef. There's less in the beef than there is in the skinless chicken, chicken breast. Uh, because they're, they're, they're growing or eating uh, lots of grass, they're extremely high in beta carotene. And it's one that always blows my mind. It has uh, as much omega-3 as the equivalent portion of wild salmon. Right? So you're starting to get the mantra, right? Higher quality. Okay? And we all now talked about all the possible elements of lower cost. Better pasture, well, with the calf, less debt loss, all of those things. So this is why I gave you the preamble at the beginning. This is all part of the same fundamental approach to, to farming. So why tamales? Uh, it's a great place. <laughs> it is a wonderful location. Uh, we have the good fortune of, of uh, being able to acquire in 2005 uh, what was then a very underutilized Serini ranch. Uh, Gail Serini was kind enough to uh, enter into a, a, a discussion with us. Some of you know that uh, some of the proceeds from uh, that purchase went to help restore the, the uh, town hall here in Tamales and a number of other things were byproducts of that. But Romeo, uh, her husband, had stopped dairying here in 1960. So uh, very little that happened other than the, the pastures being leased out. And frankly, when we arrived, they were either filled with weeds and ponds that had been hopelessly overgrazed. Uh, but the ocean influence uh, uh, climate is so much like the natural habitat of, of the highlands. And the, as you all know, well managed. This is fabulous grass. You know? So maybe this is the Sonoma County of grass that Ferndale was in that valley of grass. <laughs> I don't, it's the Marin County of grass. Right? Uh, so uh, it does require uh, appropriate uh, uh, management. As as I suggested. But, you know, they're also they're coming to this community that is deep local knowledge about cattle uh, and sheep, which uh, we respect very deeply and uh, felt comfortable coming to a place like this where when people started to realize that we were serious and we actually had a rationale for what we were trying to do, actually get pitched in on many, so many dimensions to that help us as we went along. And then we had uh, amazing support from the very beginning, which continues to this day. Uh, we were uh, able to purchase this uh, ranch, which was uh, a substantial sum of money with uh, the help of Bob uh, Berners here in the room, who was the executive director of the of at the time. Uh, and over the years, we've had lots of help from NCRS, uh, the, the Blue Point Conservancy, uh, straw, some of you must know what straw is. It's a program, educational program for the elementary and middle schools that uh, allows them to uh, uh, learn more about native plants and so on. So this has been a, a uh, wonderfully supportive community. It's pretty remarkable where we are. Uh, this is a painting of uh, basically our property down this way. Uh, before the uh, Keys Creek silted in from inappropriate production of potatoes. Most of you guys know this too. Uh, the the, the flat-bottom boats came all the way up to across the street here is the is that blue building where it's vacation rentals. Well, our property actually goes behind it, under the highway, and behind it, and and so it's a continuation of the way Keys Creek went. And there's actually an old structure there where potatoes were loaded. Right? And then they came all the way down uh, Keys Creek, went to Tamales Bay, were most likely transferred to a larger ship, and then went out the, the uh, entranceway and, and down the hill. We also, our property contains the, uh, uh, the Narrow Gauge Railroad. You go south towards uh, uh, Nick's Cove, and you look closely on the right-hand side, that's all our property. Right? Um, there's a railroad tunnel there. 
Now it's having that for bats. <laughs> Which is good, right? Which is good. So, you know, this is a very significant uh, uh, place to, to be. You all know that. So, so in, in uh, the, the way our family business has evolved, we have several locations. Um, and uh, Ferndale, Mendocino County, uh, Napa Valley, and then here in Marin County. And so we refer to this as Kamala Station. Right? We call it Long Meadow Ranch Kamala Station. Now I think you see the logic of that. Um, we're not entirely sure, maybe the historical side that can help us with this as to where that narrow gauge uh, railroad ended, and whether it ended on our property or whether it continued a little bit further. But it's uh, uh, a very attractive location. So how do we produce? It's a simple, probably simple three-step process. Uh, we maintain our cow-calf operation here in Tomales. Uh We move those uh, cattle to uh, some finishing uh, pastures in Ferndale, which are very rich with grass. Uh, and then they are ultimately uh, uh, harvested at a, uh, a, an abattoir that we helped put back into business in uh, Eureka. It's called Redwood Meats. Uh, it's been a huge problem. Uh, anybody that has livestock knows this in spades. You know, basically the, the, the meat packers unions, uh, including with the USDA, have driven out all the small uh, 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 slaughterhouses all across the country, but it's especially a big problem here in Northern California. Uh, so uh, Eureka Redwood Meat is the, is the principal source, which now because we helped them get restarted, it's really a uh, burgeoning business uh, of being a, a petite, petite um, producer. But one of the things that it also allows us to do is that, um, again, what, what makes beef palatable, right, is that the animal is slaughtered without stress. If they have stress, they're filled with, you know, they're filled with adrenaline and, and, and tight, and guess what, that gets passed on to the beef. So that's why if you have a ranch kill, of an animal and you want to buy a quarter from a rancher, why it's so good. Part of it's because it treated it well and it got fed well. But part of it's because the animal didn't have any idea that it was coming. Right? And so we try to maintain that sort of thing. So we take 10 animals at a time, uh, less than 10 miles. Uh, low stress, make sure that they get settled. And then we help design a receiving system there by, with the help of a a uh, really amazing woman named Temple Grandin, right? And, you know, she's autistic, but she's brilliant, right? So our receiving facility at, we got a USDA grant, thank you, uh, to help Redwood <coughs> to build this Temple Grandin design receiving her. So guess what? That step also ends up with us having higher quality uh, beef. Our pasture system, which we at the moment aren't uh, using as aggressively, but I want to mention it because I'm very proud of it. Working with a guy named Jay Russ, uh, we devised a 28 paddock uh, rotational grazing system. We put 105 animals on one acre. Sounds crazy, right? For one day. And you always end up with a lead cow. Doesn't take much management. You go out there, you take the, the electric fence, uh, open it up, the lead cow goes, and the 104 would go right behind it. It would perfectly mow the, 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 uh, the paddock. We wouldn't have, as you would have if we'd done it, allowed the animals, even the highlands, to do it uh, more at leisure. They would eat all the really good stuff first, and then they come back and get the rest of it. Because they're all eating in that same pasture for one day, they took it all down, which meant that we had a better pasture. It moved on. We did that for 28 days. <clears throat> to restart it if the cattle weren't fully finished. But here's the real insight, is that, um, you know, worms and cattle, right? They, those are basically planted by flies, right? It's part of the fly cycle. It's part of the worm cycle. But, you know, the, the, the breeding cycle, of uh, uh, worm flies is 21 days. 
So if you move the cattle 28 days and you have lots of sunshine, guess what? They come back to this pasture and there are no parasites. So if there are no parasites, we don't have to worm the cattle, which actually mocks the back, but it's also an expense. Right? Again, you start to see responsible farming leads to higher quality at lower cost. So, you know, there's, there's um, uh, a lot of uh, careful thought and planning that goes into building a full cycle system, and I think you're now starting to get the idea. What we do here at Tamales is we have two breeding groups. Um, we've learned that even that the way they produce the very best and, and productive beef in, uh, in uh, Scotland was to take advantage of the heterosis. In fact, when you crossbreed two animals that are pretty tightly genetically um, uh, different and very close in their genetics, you get about a 15% gain in the, in the performance of the animal. And so what we do is we breed a small group of purebred highlands with, a, with two purebred highland bulls, uh, and we produce wonderful heifers that ultimately become our cows. And on our uh, main beef production herd, so all of those cows graduate, uh, all those heifers graduate to be part of the cow calf operation, and then we select very carefully uh, uh, Angus bulls that are same modern frame good hips, good feet, uh, relatively small uh, birth weight, and so we create terminal crosses. So our primary beef production is Angus on Highland cattle. What's amazing about it is we get all the maternal benefits, right? The cattle uh, finish four to six months earlier than the purebred animals, again, higher quality, lower cost, and they retain all the attributes of the uh, uh, of purebred highland beef. And there's another tremendous benefit if you're going through a slaughterhouse, even one, even one designed by Temple Grandin, is the horns are a real pain. And, and, and you know, and if, if the animal does get riled up, you've got to watch out. But so all of these calves are cold, so they don't have any horns. So we end up with high quality beef growing faster and not having the issue of having them have cold, uh, horns, and they all end up male and female are a part, they're all terminal, so we're not rebreeding them again. And we have the benefit of mama cow that has all the attributes that we've already discussed. So if you look out here right now, straight ahead across the way, uh, you'll see a beautiful set of uh, highland cows and calves. Those are all our pre purebred uh, replacement heifers. And the, the, the males in that group will all become steers and we will put them into the, to the rest of the program. And the main core of what we do is uh, all the high uh, females crossed by the Angus bulls. So this is a picture of what the, uh, the cat calves look like. Right? And they, they have, sometimes they have the black color of uh, wool, sometimes they have that dun color. You see the dun sort of gray, crescent gray in the, in the picture. That's all uh, uh, natural variation. Somebody was asking me earlier about a white cow that she'd seen right, right here. The pilots have six different colors. Basically black, uh, red, yellow, uh, brindle, uh, dun, and white. Did I say white in the front? No. So that's, that's the six colors. Those are the six colors. And uh, they don't have any correlation to the performance of the animal uh, or the performance of the beef. That's just natural variation. So our calves, those genetics will mix with the, with the black uh, color and we'll get all these sort of interesting uh, colors of calves. But this is what becomes beef. And our home ranch in the Napa Valley where we still are keeping cattle, we make that our place for specialty animals. So when those uh, heifers across the street are weaned, we take them to our home ranch, and that's where we keep them until they're ready to come back here to join the main cattle herd. It has the benefit of those are by far our most valuable animals. They're going to produce calves for us for 15 years. 
Uh, it also gives us a way of socializing them. They get a little bit more contact. Laddie takes the dog and walks around with them. But by having them settled and settled with humans, again, what it does is allows us to operate the main herd with a lot, without a lot of thrashing and gnashing and so on. We need fewer, we need fewer ranch hands uh, to be able to do it. So we also send our bulls there uh, over the winter. Uh, we don't really want those guys breeding other than in a particular period. So our bulls are here from the 4th, the 4th of July till about the 1st of September. And that allows us to, to have calves born more or less the 15th of April to the 15th of, of May. We're spring calvers. We believe that that allows the, the mother cow to be able the best possible feed, to be able to create the best possible milk, to be able to get that calf off to a good start. There are others that are fall calvers. We see a lot of Angus cattle being calved now. And that system also makes sense, but it's just not what we're doing because we're so fundamentally based on, uh, uh, on grass. We have some pretty nifty facilities there that I built well, more than 20 years ago that uh, a really high quality uh, uh, squeeze and uh, sort of a veterinary area where if we choose to, we can do both AI and IVF in vitro fertilization uh, to uh, give us the opportunity to enhance the genetics of our operation. We basically today operate a closed herd, which means that we don't accept any, any genetics outside of our direct control when we do when we add a new bull, uh, it's very carefully thought through because I hope, if you're again, you come over and look here, and you, you think about the phenotype, the shape of the animal, they all look the same. They all look the same. That's on purpose, right? One of the problems with the beef industry is they're all of different sizes. You know, sometimes you get an eight inch ribeye, sometimes you get a 16 inch ribeye. That makes the chef crazy, <laughs> right? It also makes it very hard for you to figure out how to appropriately handle them or lots of other things. So maintaining that, that uh, consistent, uh, carefully crafted uh, genetic base really matters. So believe it or not, a herd of highlands is called a foal. That comes from Scotland. We have the largest foal of highland cattle rock west of the Rocky Mountains. So, Tamales is the capital of Highland Cat. <laughs> Aren't those cows on the top part of this picture majestic? I took that photo just three weeks, two weeks ago, when we were, we were marking the calves. Uh, and they were all standing up there watching us. And you could see some of the calves the that we finished were the crossbreds that you could see there in the foreground. I hope by now it goes without saying is that we're deeply committed to responsible stewardship. That's what we do here. Uh, we, 90% uh, of the property is covered by all uh, conservation easements. Uh, Bob and I were reminiscing about this. We eliminated 28 buildable lots. Uh, the, the area around the high school, you know, where we have all those wonderful pastures over there, that was all subdivided. That was all ready to be a subdivision. And uh, part of the arrangement we had with, with Paul when we bought the property from the Shrini was to make all that go away. So where we don't have a conservation easement, it's basically to allow us to have some flexibility for ultimately restoring some of the, the farming operations. We have very detailed pasture management plans. Uh, if you're a rancher and you look closely, you understand what we're doing. Uh, you know, we're restoring the native grasses down here along the highway, but we've had a lot of help uh, from ourselves, but from the USDA and others, so we, there's extensive cross-fencing. We have dispersed waterers uh, so that all the cattle don't go all in the same place and beat up the ground over and over again. Uh, so they're dispersed into all of these different pastures, which enables us to, to rotate, but also make sure that the ground doesn't get, get overgrazed. We've restricted the, asset, the access to all of our riparian ways uh, so that all the streams, uh, cattle are not uh, in, uh, and especially during the, the wet season, 
But one of the benefits of the Highland cattle is that we can, we can help reduce the, uh, the overgrowth in the repairing way. So we need both shade, but we also don't need them to become clogged again. So we have, uh, part of our pasture management plan is that we're able to open up those repairing areas and put our Highland cattle in them for seven days or eight days. We take little sections. And because they're browsers, guess what? They help keep the waterway, uh, the waterway open. Uh, we're regularly monitored by MALT, uh, the USDA, uh, the Water Board, uh, lots of other folks, and I'm very proud to say that we've been open-minded about making these uh, locations a sites for uh, scientific inquiry. So we've had at least four major studies of aquatic insects, uh, bird populations, uh, native grass populations uh, that uh, because we don't have anything to hide, we, we, uh, we kind of embrace it. And it's proven to be uh, really interesting because the results from these things are, are fascinating and, and we often learn something more than we initially knew. To get this done, we have an exception, exceptional team. Uh, Joseph Harden uh, is from the Napa Valley, but he's fifth generation cattle rancher. Uh, he's our director of ag operations, so he takes care of orchards, vineyards, uh, fruits and vegetables, cattle, uh, and extremely knowledgeable. We have the tremendous benefit of having Bill Jensen, uh, good old local Tamales guy, as our, he prefers that I call him resident advisor, <laughs> not resident manager, because he doesn't want you all to come talking to him. <laughs> but he's our resident advisor. But what he really is, is our guru. And uh, because he has been here for generations, it really understands this business in a cattle uh, rancher and uh, uh, sheep farmer uh, for, for his entire life. And that's been enormously helpful. A guy named Art Townsend, who's uh, kind of our Ferndale version of, uh, of, of Bill, uh, manages our finishing operation there. Uh, Nathan Kiefer, I don't want to ever use him as, our, as your vet, but he's been with us since the beginning and he's kind of a part of the family. And he's learned about these animals. Is it, you know, if you think about it, me calling up a vet and saying, hey, will you come over here and help us with these longhorn, crazy, paternal cattle? He said, well, you know, I need my arms. <laughs> if I'm going to continue to practice. So Nathan would be great. Uh, Chewy Hernandez, known to many people around here, works in various dairies, has been an enormously valuable ranch hand. We have a, a young woman who's our uh, assistant to make sure that we don't lose any cattle. So uh, she keeps track of, of, uh, of the counts, uh, the ear tags, and all of those things. So what does this end up with? Well, it's, as I hope I convinced you, uh, extraordinary grass-fed beef. It's really uh, amazing stuff. Uh, and we serve 100% uh, uh, grass-fed Highland beef in our restaurant in uh, Napa Valley, which is called Farmstead at Long Meadow Ranch. And over and over again, we get the comment, best burger I ever tasted. And uh, now you may start to grasp that. I mean, it's on great grass, it's great flavor, doesn't have very much fat. Uh, and is a really wonderful thing. It is available, but not very far. Uh, Laddie goes to, um, uh, it will goes to our restaurant, obviously, which is where the majority of the beef, and also uh, lamb that's produced here on the Jensen Ranch. Uh, it goes to our, our restaurant, and Laddie goes to three farmer's markets a week. Uh, can you believe that? Uh, to uh, twice to Napa and uh, once to the St. Helena Market, where we have a very loyal following. And we are also in a small group of uh, Bay Area restaurants, which we used to do 15 or 20 years ago. We now uh, have started again. We've got a lot of requests, and so you will see a few places where it will say uh, Long Meadow Ranch uh, grass fed beef. Uh, it's also uh, newly available uh, online through a very interesting distributor named Heritage Foods, where they're selling um, our grass-fed beef, and we have a, uh, a partner uh, who uh, produces pork uh, with us, 
and we uh, produce a spectacular bacon. So you can also buy uh, beef and bacon in the same in the same package. Uh, not in the same package, but in the same market. <laughs> so I have to tell you, though, coming here, uh, you know, I know unless we're going to be here 75 years, we're still newbies and we're outsiders. But I never expected the embrace from uh, this community. I mean, you go to Dink Dinkman's, right? And there's the hat that says the walls. And there it has our cow. <laughs> Seriously, can you believe that? <laughs> and even crazier, I don't get a royalty. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, the, uh, the fact that the town advertises the Tamales Festival with one of our cattle. Uh, with, well, I have to tell you guys the truth. So I'm coming down, oh, before you make the turn, there at the Coast Guard Station, and uh, there on that corner, there's this big poster a year ago with a big Highland cow on it. I almost wrecked my car. <laughs> I just, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And then, you know, you go to Neekman's, and then there's pillows, and t-shirts, and stuffed animals, right? all the violence. And then if you go over to the bakery, and you look at the checkout thing, right, where you put your credit card, there's a highly cow looking at you. <laughs> so I guess we must have uh, a local identity. So, you know, I wasn't sure, at least real, I always thought of these as being the Highland Cattle of Long Meadow Ranch. But maybe they are the Highland Cattle of uh, Kamala. So, uh, you've been wonderful to listen to me today, and uh, it's also this warm embrace by the community who's been spectacular. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. We didn't really have the dialogue that I promised before, but uh, please, there's a hand right here. I was just wondering, can you name some of the restaurants where your beef is, is served? I can't at the moment because it's a brand new program. Uh, but you know, the best thing to do is to come over to St. Helena and come to our restaurant. I love your restaurant. I love your restaurant. Awesome. Right here? And, uh, you know, I'll do a lot like the Scottish coastal area, but do these cattle do okay in a hotter environment? Yeah, it's not cool, but. Do they even thrive in Texas or anything? They are in Texas. They are. And, uh, uh, and you know, one of the things about uh, hardy animals like this that, that have, uh, are well bred uh, is they, they adapt. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they adapt, uh, uh, they don't grow as much hair. Uh, personally, I think that's, uh, you know, I wouldn't move to Texas and, and start doing Highland cattle. If I moved to Texas, you know, I'd do Herefords or something that would derive from Highland cattle, but were very better suited to the environment. And, and how did they do during the three-year drought? Did you have trouble with the grass? Uh, we did. Uh, thankfully, this year it's, we had more feed than we could eat. Uh, but uh, during the drought, we had some real issues. We had uh, one of the big red barns was totally stuffed with uh, purchased hay, uh, and we had to go a long way to get that hay. And I thought you were expensive. Well, yeah, I mean, you no, know, it used to be you could buy a ton of hay in the field for 60 bucks. And if you could have delivered to your barn for 140, so still transportation was the biggest part of it. So at the worst, we were getting hay from uh, Nevada, it was costing us more than $400 a ton. Yeah. Right. So what that tells you, you've got to do, uh, uh, that, that's another illustration of you better be doing responsible pasture management, right? Because you want that grass to come back as, as, as soon as it can. And, you know, we've been very lucky that that happened. But that was a, that was a very painful period for us. Back here, back. Yeah, um, I've read about um, some ranchers up in Mendocino County um, trying to work with seaweed as a way to help offset the methane complaint that uh, so much of the beef industry's been hit with. Um, and I'm just curious, but like somebody was uh, experimenting with putting, I guess, algae, He's working with somebody, I think in Japan and developing um, algae farming and distributing it in their grasslands to help. Uh, I was just curious, one, about the um, highlands 
um, you know, digestive tract system, if there's any difference there, if it shares the same grievances that other cows that are grass, I mean, I'm, like, I think the whole uh, question of methane concerns uh, is quite different for a feedlot situation than it is for pasture raised, but I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, sure. So the, the, the question was, uh, what's, what's the impact of uh, seaweed and other uh, algae-like uh, supplements on the emission of uh, methane gas from the cattle? And does it work? And where is it used? And is it relevant to our operation? Uh, first point is that it works. Uh, I happen to have a lot of experience in another business I'm involved in with, with that aspect. It works the best, it has the biggest incremental impact of containing the methane output in animals that are otherwise being partially fed. So it works really well to reduce methane from dairies. Right. Uh, and it clearly is a concern for, for folks in, in feedlots. The trade-off there is it's relatively low caloric value. So it, and so people chasing a dollar to get the cattle to grow faster may not be willing to displace some caloric feed with the algae, but it's coming. Ultimately, I think that's going to get regulated, at least in those concentrated areas. Uh, highland cattle are uh, such efficient uh, grazers uh, and efficient uh, fermenters. Uh, the incremental value of doing that is, is really de minimis. Uh, if, uh, uh, if we're to be shown that we should be doing that, even for our cattle, we'll be the first to do it. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, it's a great question, and it's actually it's very encouraging. Uh, you know, this, the, just the the use of these uh, supplements uh, in some circumstances reduces the methane gas from these animals by ninety percent. I personally think that uh, that shouldn't be a surprise because probably in the original. Uh, untouched environment, uh, there was a much richer set of plants than we have today, and that those plants very well may have uh, been providing this equivalent uh, effect in the gut that the seaweed is today. So it's it's probably just a substitute for something that previously was happening naturally. There's a question over here. I love your cows. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> to trying your restaurant, I have a couple of questions. Can you sure. buy these cattle and what do they cost? And how do you transport one of those cows? <laughs> if I had one, I couldn't put it in a horse trailer, right? Well, you can't put it in a horse trailer. What do you do with those <laughs> cows? No, you put it in a big trailer, a big wide cattle trailer. And, and we have, our, our trailers have compartments, okay. so it helps keep the cattle stable. They, don't, they aren't falling and, and crushing each other. Yeah. Uh, the other interesting thing about the horns is that the, the um, if not provoked, uh, they're pretty benign. You know, I used to have these little treats for um, the cattle that for, for alfalfa pellets. We, we refer to it as cake. And I could take a, a, it looked like a piece of chalk, a little bit thicker than a piece of chalk. I could walk up to one of my animals and pull out my hand like this with the, with the alfalfa cake, and she would knock that out of my hand. It's just the main, they know what the heck they're doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, if they're part of the same herd, there's no pecking order issues, uh, it's, it's manageable. We have to be careful about it. Right? And um, you know, we never use an electric prod, we never rile them up. Everything's slow motion, uh, quiet movements. Uh, we can get these cattle to move just by physical presence getting on the flank and they'll move. And uh, the minute you decide that uh, you're going to treat them some other way, uh, you're a mountain lion. Oh, yeah. right? <laughs> right? You're that coyote and you better watch out. So, you know, it's again, it's the skill of the cattle. Uh, how much do they cost? Well, it's a trade secret. <laughs> uh, a, uh, a top breeding cow uh, at the national auction uh, 
might sell for $2,500 to $4,000. Uh, a very high quality replacement heifer will sell almost in that same range. Uh, because if, if you think about the economics of it, you're buying 15 years of calves. If you're buying an older animal, you're only buying seven or eight or nine years of calves. And so it's the, it's the discounted cash flow, right, of more calves. But they're extremely valuable. Uh, and because we can get the, the equivalent of uh, a, a, a two or three times multiple over conventional uh, corn fed beef, uh, the final product is very expensive. It's very cost effective. And you know, there are also other things like these hides. This is a dumb animal, and that's a, one of our red animals. And uh, you know, if uh, we're able to sell those, uh, the value of our animal just went way up, but well over its meat value. So, in the back, Elizabeth. First of all, Ted, I want to thank you for coming today. Very, very interesting. Um, I did want to just add something a little bit off topic that I'm sure the community is interested in. And it's what we were talking about earlier about the leading silo. Yeah. Yes. Fill us in on what's going on. It's a perfectly fair question that if I were in the audience, I'd be asking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, many of you have lived here and lived in this community and will understand immediately what I'm about to say. But, you know, we had uh, more ambitions for this property when we initially acquired it. And, it, it, and in fact, to renovate and repurpose some of the, some of the buildings. Um, like many of you, we encountered the Coastal Commission. Uh, I spent eight years, eight years, to just get a lot line adjustment done. Uh, so that's had a very chilling effect on our thought processes to what to do and how to do it, and could we ever get things uh, approved in a timely way? That's saying nothing about the somewhat uh, bureaucratic processes of the county. So uh, Steve Kinsey was of enormous help to us in the early stages. Uh, Bob gave us some advice, um, but uh, that more than anything has, has resulted in us leaving some of the housing buildings that are in there. Uh, because we're trying to grandfather the footprint. And if we could ever get through uh, the approval process, <clears throat> we, would, we would deal with it. So um, it's regulation. It's the unintended consequence of well-intended regulation that is causing these issues. And uh, so it doesn't make any economic sense for me to, to destroy uh, building the parcels, right? I, you guys ought to, ought to all agree with that. Because uh, I've already given up more than 30. Right? Uh, so uh, the issue with the silo is everybody's afraid to take it down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've, we've talked to lots of people. It's very heavy. Uh, it's made from uh, clear redwood, vertical slats, all tongue and groove. Uh, it was never used by Romero. Uh, he was a little bit eclectic at times and he would do things. And uh, uh, why he never used it uh, you know, so long ago, maybe somebody here has part of the boat for uh, But uh, so it's a, it's a real oddity. It has uh, aesthetic value, right? If you're standing on the front steps of the Catholic Church, I mean, it looks great. But uh, if any of you are interested in helping us take it down, or to write it. Uh, please call Bill, and then Bill will call me. Can it be preserved the way it is? It's so beautiful. Preserve it as leaning, even yeah. though it's leaning? Yeah. But something, I, you know, I was teasing somebody about it earlier, is that it's, it's so wedged in there at the moment, it's part of the problem of how we get it out of it, is uh, maybe it is the leaning tower of Pisa. It's the leaning, it's the leaning silo of the mall. <laughs> Sell tickets, right? T shirts. T shirts. Oh, yeah, and hats. So, if you don't use horns to attack it, in your pastures, uh, are you fertilizing or drilling seed to pastures? Uh, yes and no. I mean, we're not drilling seed. We're relying, you know, at this stage, relying on the, the perennial grasses. 
Uh, we've never drilled sea yet. No. And um, uh, if we were to do uh, fertilizing, which I think we did do um, on the area here at the high school way, way back, it would be uh, manure-based compost. Um, there's, we would never use uh, uh, chemical fertilizers, no NPK, that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, well managed, right? These are not depleting activities, right? I mean, you know, mountain grasslands went on for centuries. They were only grazed by elk and deer, right? And they didn't have to fertilize. <laughs> and so that's the, that's the fundamental system that we're trying to, trying to operate. We're selling them all right here. Do you sell the skulls? We do sell the skulls. Where, where do you sell those? Well, talk to my wife. <laughs> we sell them at the farmer's market. Yeah, you know, they, they, I, this is, was not a commercial venture, but if you like the skull, talk to Latin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for giving our small community such an iconic uh, and masterful item. Do they eat thistles, and how are they with fences? Some thistles they will eat, some they won't. But if they're young thistles, uh, and you're intensively farming, you never get a big thistle. So uh, it's about, especially in Ferndale, we're very cautious of that. So as part of the, the rotational uh, 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 grazing system, is if we can get the cattle on there at the right time, those weeds never happen. If, they, if we allow them to be there, we try to introduce the cattle later, they're not crazy, right? And so they'll, they'll leave it behind. So that's why, uh, you know, the farm this way, you have to be extremely observant. You have to be thinking about the cycle of the plants that you're, you're dealing with, right? And the, I was on an organic farming panel uh, uh, with a few other folks, a, a guy named uh, Steve Mathiasen, who's a, a wonderful uh, biologist, PhD guy that's also a, a viticulturalist. And uh, some smart guy in the audience raised his hand and said, so what's the difference between a good farmer and a bad farmer? And uh, Steve said, without even a second hesitation, he said, seven days. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Right? That actually speaks to the liturgy of the biodynamics. But, you know, you've got to be you, you know, you cut your hay at the wrong time, right? All of these things, right? You, you have to see it. So that's that's the way you have to manage. Have we let the wine business go? Have we left the wine business go? Thank goodness, no. <laughs> One of the benefits of what we do is it's diversified. Yeah. Thank you. One of the benefits of what we do is diversified. Right? And uh, the wine business is still probably the long pole of the tent. Okay. Although, uh, Did you bring any taste? <laughs> no. No. I wasn't asked to do that. Hamburgers, this side is, you know, maybe you should sell our hamburger at the, at the festival. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, all the way to that. Yeah, I was wondering, um, would you rec could you speak a little bit about the temperament of the breed, whether or not you'd recommend it for someone who has like 10 acres and wants, you know, seven head of cattle on it, and also some of the challenges that come with uh, processing. Currently, we're using like a squeeze chute, and I'm sure you can't do that with, with, the, with the longhorns. And, um, and then the last thing was whether or not they, they, they eat switchgrass. Well, they what? Eat switchgrass. Uh, yes, I think so. Okay. But uh, uh, I need to see what species you have in your speaking but. Uh, the, the, the question was, uh, would you recommend this breed for a uh, small-scale, uh, 10 acre kind of situation? Um, the honest answer is, is no, unless you've already raised cattle before. We used to sell some of our animals to, to hobbyists um, who liked the way they looked. And they wanted to decorate their lawn with the cattle. <laughs> Right? I was actually speaking to a group once, and, and we were talking about appropriate animal husbandry practices. This is not to pick on you, by the way, but just to illustrate it. And we would say, um, uh, 
uh, how do you worm your cattle? And people in the audience went, worm? <laughs> how many of you have a cattle trailer? No hands. How many of you have a squeeze? No hands. So to be fair to the animal, you have to be able to deal with all of the things that keeps that animal healthy, right? And that requires sufficient space, that requires the right kind of equipment. If your animal gets sick uh, or gets injured, you can't always rely on the vet to come to use. You know, and there's a large animal hospital right here in Penaluma, right? I've rushed my bulls here, I've rushed my bulls to, to UC Davis. And so so to, to honor the animal, you really have to be prepared to do all that. For most people that have never raised cattle before, that's a long, uh, that's a big stretch. Uh, it's, you know, it's 10 times harder than raising a puppy. So, yeah. so I'm currently using a sweet shoot to process my cattle, whether it's AI or whether it's yeah. to, to um, band them or whatever, uh, given their vaccinations. And I'm asking that with the, with the large horns, is there, is there special check? Uh, long horn. It's designed for longhorn cattle. Uh, the big spires of those now are highland uh, breeders, but they also are, are used with longhorns. So yes, it's available. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I like what I think your approach is. You may be able to make it work. Just remember that you need to rotate the pasture, right? And so this is the other classic problem. Is that if you buy cattle, pilot cattle from anybody other than us in California, uh, you need to be very cautious. If you buy pilot cattle from lots of people elsewhere in the country, uh, where there's lots of cattle being bred, you won't likely have a problem. But the basic problem occurred here is if you have too many hobbyists who <coughs> get three heifers and a bull, and they leave the bull in with the heifers all the time. Uh, and then what happens to the heifer? Uh, becomes uh, reproductively mature, and she gets bred by the bull. He's breeding his daughter, and worse yet, he's breeding her when she's one year old or 14, uh, 16 months old, and it results in stunted cattle. So if you were going to the market for hiding cattle, you would see a lot of short, uh, funny looking cattle, and it's because of the inability to properly manage. So, and, and you know, to be able to keep a bull separate, uh, and when the cat, when a cow is cycling, uh, is a real challenge. So that's why we take all our bulls to over the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> they just yeah, they just they just Uber back here. All right, like, party time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me preface my questions by saying I'm a city girl, so I don't know anything about cattle. Do males and females have horns? When do the calves start growing horns? And how does the horn length compare with kind of Texas long horns? Well, good question. Um, she's asking about horns and how they occur and how fast they grow. Um, uh, males and females have horns. They're not deer, uh, they're cattle. Uh, and they all have horns. Even the short horn breed, all, all males and females have have uh, horns. Uh, the calves basically have the buds of the horns at birth. And uh, our uh, uh, replacement heifers that are our main ranch right now, home ranch right now, and they are, what, they were April last year, so they're 16 months, something like that. And they have discernible horns. Uh, what's interesting about the horns is they'll, they'll grow for the, the, the life of the animal. So one of the easy ways for you to tell uh, the age of a cow is how long her horns are. And, and it's also, you know, one of the great tragedies of people dehorning cattle because it's extraordinarily painful and it's a really bad thing. And that's something else we have to be careful about where our cattle go uh, because people get afraid of the horns and then they cut them off, which is inhumane. Uh, the, uh, uh, how do they compare to Texas Longhorns? Uh, that's a really good question because it's the Longhorns that you see like like Bebo, you know Bebo is, is the Texas University of Texas mascot that they have on the football field. 
right? And Bebo has really long horns. Well, he's a steer. He's probably 18 years old, right? And we have a couple of heads from uh, one of my friends back in Minnesota uh, actually kept some males and turned them into oxen. He was brilliant at training them, the oxen. And we, when the animals passed, uh, he uh, had one of the heads mounted. And we have, I bought one of them from him because it's wonderful. And those, those guys, you know, have horns that look like Texas Longhorns. So it's all about the age. Uh, they do are longer, uh, some of them grow more, more rapidly and are naturally probably a larger span, but um, the, the, the ones you see in the fancy photos, those are all steers that are more than 15 years old. So the horns have just continued to grow. And it's, in some crazy way, they're, they're growing those horns so that they can mount them, you know. Let's see, somebody here. Beta carotene. Okay, so is that the same thing as in carrots? Yes. 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 In, in other in other uh, 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 leafy vegetables. Okay. Yeah. Very good for you. Right here. Uh, before we talk about the benefits of your organic farming and like cultural farming, what were some of the problems that you encountered doing it this way? Question is, what were our problems we encountered from? Uh, uh, doing full cycle farming, um, organic farming, um, not totally understanding the, the, the biology or the, the, the cycle of what we were doing. What, what I do want, there's an implied question there, which happens with anybody that starts talking about organic farming, which is, what do you do when you get pests? Or what do you do when it doesn't work? Well, the answer is, there is always an answer. We've never encountered the uh, inability to solve the problem. Do we have problems? Yes. Yes. Uh, do we have we found organic and uh, appropriate ways to deal with them? Yes. Uh, sometimes it requires us to know more about uh, the biology of the pest uh, or the, uh, the, the nature of the grass species. Right. I guess that's the one last comment I would make. At the end of the day, we don't raise bees. We're grass farmers. And that's the connection all the way back to what you're saying. We're grass farmers. And, and that's, that's the key. And this is one of the greatest places to grow grass. And that's why you see all these animals here. So we're going to finish. I'm going to jump in because we are sort of up against our time for today. I'm sure that uh, we have to answer some questions while we, while we pack up the chairs. <laughs> Love your help in taking some half the chairs down and half the chairs up on the stage. So I hope I didn't take too much of your time. <laughs> <laughs>